Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay in the back? Uh, hello, my name is uh, Rob Davis, and my co-presenter is Elker Cerbelli. Uh, I'm from Mellanox, and I will be talking about the network side of NVMe over Fabrics. Uh, and Elker um, is from Samsung. He'll be yep. talking about the storage side of NVMe over Fabrics. Yes. This is uh, NVMe over Fabrics is an exciting new technology that was. NVMe over Fabrics, sorry about that, is an exciting new technology that uh, was developed um, as an extension to NVMe, uh, which is a technology that came about to improve the performance of SSDs by eliminating or redesigning the legacy interface from hard drives. So when SSDs first came out, they had SAS SATA interfaces like hard drives did. What NVMe did, and Elker's going to go into details on it, was they redesigned the interface to dramatically improve the performance. So why uh, NVMe over Fabrics and why, why do we need to invent this new technology um, to, to connect SSDs across networks? And the reason is because there's really a revolution occurring in the storage industry right now. Um, to give you a feel for, for what's happening, um, the performance of, of storage in general is going to improve or has improved 100 times with the advent of SSDs in the last five years, and it's going to improve another 100 times with the advent of persistent memory, which you're probably hearing about is just starting to come out. So that's a 10,000 times improvement in storage technology that's going to occur in basically a 10-year period. That's huge. To, to get a feel for for how dramatic and the magnitude of that, of that change. Think about um, driving from here in Boston to St. Louis. It's about 1,000 miles, straight out I-70 all the way. According to Google, 18 hours. Now think about driving over to Boston College. You know, it's, according to Google, 15 minutes. Probably a lot of that is uh, Boston traffic, right? So it's a congested network, but that's 10 miles. 1,000 miles to St. Louis, 10 miles over to Boston College. That's the magnitude of the change just going from hard drives to SSDs. Now let's think about the persistent memory. That's basically 500 feet in, this, in my distance um, description. That's the length of the show floor down there. So that's the distance. I'll think about Boston College, think about two football fields, less than two football fields. That's the dramatic change here, the magnitude of the change. And that change, um, with that change, like any engineering breakthrough, it's caused other problems. The next problem pops up. And that next problem is that now the network for connecting this fast storage across the network is becoming the bottleneck. In this slide, what I'm showing is the time it takes to access data across a network um, the green is the wire, and the, the red is the protocol, the network protocol, and then the blue piece is how long you wait for the hard drive to respond. So you can see with hard drives, the network um, latency was minimal. If we go to SSDs, you can see it becomes much more significant. When we go to persistent memory, all of a sudden it's almost equal. So in order to be able to use this new 10,000 times improved storage, we have to fix the wires, make the wires faster, and we have to address the protocol and make the protocol faster. And that's what NVMe technology and NVMe over fabrics is all about. Now I'm going to turn it over to Elker, and he's going to talk about the NVMe storage part, and then I'll come back and talk about the network. Thanks, Rob. Well, uh, welcome to the session. Uh, I hope my scratchy throat doesn't uh, bother everybody. But I want to ask first, how many people are here hardware versus software? Let's see, how many hardware people here? Oh, that's good. We were afraid this is a Red Hat Summit and everybody's going to be software because Rob and I are mostly hardware uh, focused. Uh, so I'm going to talk about why NVMe. So when NVMe first introduced uh, there was uh, flash was already in the, uh, being used in various forms, 
and it's been essentially the interface was SATA interface. It's designed for uh, hard drives. And if you look at the SCSI stack, it was very uh, latency uh, was significantly higher. But the NAND is uh, very good for bandwidth and read and write latencies. So you know, when you are using a very revolutionary technology, you're going 100x performance or 100x uh, latency improvements. You got to fix the protocol as well as the wires. So MVME community form in various suppliers and as, and design a new interface to bypass the uh, SCSI interface. And by doing that is uh, using the PCIe uh, protocol and uh, MME, MME messages passed to the uh, SSDs. Uh, so that significantly reduces the uh, uh, latencies. As a matter of fact, if you look at the real latencies, it will be more than uh, 2x in the order of 4 or 5x uh, compared to the iSCSI uh, stack. And I'm going to talk about a little bit and interrupt me if you have questions, but we will take the, uh, most of the questions at the end in the Q&A. Uh, what are the MVME does? Uh, so because MVME uses the PCIe as an interface, it's a natural uh, PCIe is a point-to-point -point bus, and it, it is uh, mature from the server. So it is designed for low power, low latency, and, and MVME scales very well with the PCIe. Because of that, uh, what you've seen in the past with the SATA or HDDs, uh, you can get the advantage of bandwidth and low power because you can now uh, shut down the PCIe bus in, the, in terms of power. And also the volumetrics because you no longer need the HPAs in the storage boxes or initiators. So that reduces the, not only uh, power, also the volumetrics. Now you can have a lot more capacity in the uh, storage array. And that gives you uh, better in the data centers what they care about, the TCO, and that gives you a better performance per watt and dollars. Uh, like I said, is uh, so obviously MVME will give you better uh, latencies, both in reads and writes. And then, uh, as a Samsung, we have several uh, MVME products, whether it's in the enterprise or in the data center, and as well as the low form factors and going to the clients, M.2 form factors. This is an example. Goes, it is one of our. Uh, hot selling product uh, goes into data centers. But just to give you an example, this is a, a U.2 form factor. It's called in the industrial 2.5 inch drive. And what I want to focus on is the sequential reads and writes. It's about two gigabytes per second. So in the following slides, I'll show you the example, how much performance we're going to get. So compared to HDDs today, the best HDD you can get is 80, 100 megabytes, even using 10K drives. So, and SSDs, uh, SATA SSDs, uh, roughly around four to 500 megabytes per second. So you're going about uh, four, uh, two, uh, three to four X performance on the bandwidth. So you can see that there is a, uh, we are no longer making the, the jump like uh, two X improvements. We are making a, a five X performance improvements. And as we go into the, uh, gen, this is based on Gen 3, PCI Gen 3. And when we go into Gen 4, that's gonna double the even bandwidth. So uh, my point is, we are going to uh, light speed in the storage array, and now we need to connect these. That's where Rob and I are talking about, is uh, we need to take advantage of the storage array. And as you can see, uh, 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 latency is roughly about 40-50% uh, lower. And uh, IOPS, depending on the type of workloads you use, uh, IOPS is going to drive uh, also uh, about uh, two to four X, uh, depending on the workloads and type of uh, the block sizes and Q depths you're using, sorry. Okay, let me talk about the MVME. So like, like I said, MVME uh, or uh, start uh, specifying the specifically, if you look at the latencies in the traditional storage based on the iSCSI or the SAS drives, you're looking at about 400 microsecond latencies. That's rough estimates. And when we use the RDMA protocol based on a, 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 in, in an Ethernet attach, is we drop the latency about 200 microsecond. And then from there, if you were to use MVME based, then again, it's, you're looking at 4x performance uh, latency improvements. And what, uh, like I said, what MVME does uh, avoids the iSCSI protocol and bypasses and then uses the PCIe uh, direct communication with the drives. Any questions? 
All right. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about what we have done uh, with, uh, with partnership with the Melox. And this is a, a demo uh, platform we actually put together back in last year's Flash Memory Summit. We have a, a reference platform called uh, Sierra. Uh, we demonstrated this in the Flash Memory Summit. It's a 24 MME base, all Flash Array. And the setup is based on the uh, Red Hat uh, build. And we have four initiators. They are all running Red Hat. Uh, uh, I won't talk about the which version, but it's the, uh, the version that uh, we enables the MVME over Fabric. And we contribute to the open source uh, drivers for the MVME over Fabrics. And in the middle, we have Melox uh, switch, Spectrum switch. And again, we are using the Melox uh, 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 2 by 25 gig uh, RNIC, uh, RDMA enabled uh, RNIC, uh, NIC cards. And and the target is the, again, is storage array uh, running a Red Hat built with the 24 MVMe SSDs that uh, the ones 963s I mentioned. So looking at this, some of the performance benefits. So latency, so one of the key factors, what we wanted to do is the showcase, what does the uh, shared storage versus local storage look like? As you can see from the, uh, the blue represents the local. So it means we, if you take the measurements on the uh, 24 MVMe drives or single drive, uh, how much is the latency they're reaching. The difference between the remote is only 17 microseconds. So that's pretty good uh, using a 225 gig uh, network. And going from the right, it's about nine microseconds. So it, it makes uh, really sense uh, if you're doing a shared storage array and the, your latency only uh, goes up 17 microseconds, this is a significant improvement. And let's talk about the, some of the uh, performance wise. Uh, on, the, on the gigabytes and most of the workloads and application, uh, actually IT vendors, they, they look at the gigabytes before they look at the IOPS. And gigabytes wise reads, you're looking at about only 18% degradation on the gigabytes on the reads. And then you won't see any uh, degradation on the writes because of the nature of the flash. Uh, flash on the sequential uh, writes, it, it hides the, some of the uh, performance. Uh, and on, if you translate those to IOPS, you, we're looking at uh, a, a minor degradation on the uh, reads IOPS. But the important part is I just want to point out, we're reaching in terms of a remote, uh, remote storage array, uh, 4.3 million IOPS. Uh, just to give you a perspective, I recently talked to one of the data centers. They have over 10,000 server deployments. The whole data center is running around 200K IOPS. So uh, the, the drastic change, the, the, that's based on uh, HDDs. And just the uh, other example is the, uh, any vendor from enterprise storage arrays, uh, they are not hitting no, more than 300K apps. So when we're looking at 4 million, uh, 4.3 million IAPs, so uh, 10 times more uh, performance improvements. So just to summarize, um, uh, like I said, uh, latency, remote versus local, we're looking about 10% degradation, and uh, IOPS about in the same range, 10 to 12. And then the point out throughput is the key uh, when you look at the uh, SSD arrays, uh, because the uh, nature of the workloads are going to vary. So it's about 18%. With that, I will leave to Rob. Thank you, Amper. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to the network side. Um, we've been on the storage side. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how um, NVMe over Fabrics uh, gets around the bottleneck um, we initially were, were showing on the network side. And it does that in two different ways. So there's two places you have to attack. The first is the wire. We've got to have faster wires. And the second is the protocol stack, the network side of the protocol stack. Elker described how NVMe locally uh, has a, a new lightweight, very fast interface, and I'm gonna talk about the storage side. I mean, sorry, the network side. So actually, the wires are easy. Um, since about more than a, a year and a half ago, uh, my company, Mellanox, has had 100 gigabit products in the market, 100 gigabit Ethernet products, as, and even further back for InfiniBand. But 100 gigabit Ethernet's been out for more than a year and a half, um, and that's not just in the switches, you know, switch to switch. That's all the way to the adapters. Uh, Elker's test was using uh, one of those adapters on the target side. 
and we're not the only vendor. I can think of four more vendors that have Ethernet vendors that have 100 gig in the market today. Um, also, there's new, there's new products um, from the lower end. So 25 gig is now becoming, uh, I think the saying in the, in the NIC space is that 25 is the new 10. Uh, and most of the pricing you see on switches for sure, adapters maybe not quite yet, uh, but on switches for sure, the switch ports are basically on par price, 10 gig versus, versus uh, 25. And most of the new switches can run either 10 or 25, all of ours can off of the same ports. Uh, and so basically the wires are, are kind of covered. 40 gig has been out even longer, about uh, three, three to four years, 40 gig has been out. Um, and most of the new, you know, hyperscale data centers are putting in at least 25 and, or, or they've already put in 40. So the high performance in the network is pretty much covered. If we look at, um, why this uh, performance is needed from a practical, you know, box by box perspective or drive by drive perspective. What I'm showing on this chart is a graph that shows the different network speeds, high performance network speeds. So 10 is in red and the yellow line is 40 and the blue line is 100 gig. And, and what I'm showing is how many hard disks, how many serial ATA hard disks it takes to fill a 10 gig, a 40 gig and a 100 gig pipe and you can see you know, almost 25 for a 10 gig pipe and you know hundreds for, for when you move beyond 10 gig but if we just switch to a to a SSD so the same serial AT interface with an SSD it's dropped to 2 to fill a 10 gig pipe so if you're if you have SSDs and you have a networked storage application and you're you know buying you're using 10 gig ethernet you're probably, you know, wasting your money on more than two SSDs. And granted, there's latency of the software and a lot of other aspects to it, but SSDs can fill network pipes like hard drives never could. And if we look at the NVMe technology, you know, the redesign for the SSD interfaces, all of a sudden you see that two of them will fill 40 gig and four of them almost fill a 100 gig pipe. So the message here is that if you're buying this faster storage, you also need faster networks. So um, what does that mean from a, a protocol standpoint? Um, so first of all, one of the main reasons to do NVMe over Fabric is to take this local technology and put it and make it available across a network is to get all the benefits that you know, SANS have provided for years, you know, fiber channel, iSCSI, SANS, except at the performance level of these MVME SSDs. And, you know, these are things like, uh, you know, utilization, right? If you've got all your drives spread across a whole bunch of servers, it's pretty, pretty hard to get a good utilization of those drives because the different applications might not use as much of the drive as other applications. And then you've got a new application, you've got to go find a machine that has a lot of storage space. But if you put it all in network storage, it doesn't matter, right? It's all in one place, so you can get better utilization. All the apps are going to one place for their storage. And that, of course, means less rack space because you can get denser servers with less storage in them. And that means less power. So much better utilization across the board when you use network storage. Secondly, you get better scalability. So if you need to add more storage and you've got it all in one place, you just add more storage there versus going around and adding it to a whole bunch of servers. It's better, easier to manage, again, because it's in one place. And it's easier to replace um, bad components. You know, usually they're hot swappable in the systems that are you know, network based and you can just go switch out the SSD or the hard drive. And um, if there's high availability, you have two separate data paths to um, the storage then it, you know, if you've got it spread across a whole network, it's a lot harder than in one place. So NVMeware Fabrics gives those, those sand um, storage area network capabilities to this new high performance NVMe interface. Uh, so NVMeware Fabrics is a total industry standard. It was developed by the same organization that did NVMe. It's called NVMe.org. You can go to their website, all their specs you can download. It's open. You don't have to be a member. Um, many companies contributed. Uh, Elker's company uh, had architects. My company had architects. Um, 
pretty much anybody in the storage or server you know, industry architects worked on this. Version 1 came out in June of um, last year, but there was a lot of work going on before that. Um, and you know, there were early demos. Uh, the first one my company did was um, now more than two years ago at the NAB show, um, but demos were done. You know, I know Intel did a demo even earlier at an IDF maybe in 2014. So a lot of uh, pre-standard work or work going on demonstrating the technology before the standard was complete. Version 1 demonstrations happen, fully standardized version 1 demonstration happen pretty much across the board starting with the fall show season last year. So at the Flash Memory Summit, which is the premier show for SSDs, um, here's a list of, just a list of some of the companies that Mellanox uh, did demonstrations with. At uh, IDF, the Intel Developers Forum, there's a list of all the, uh, of companies that Mellanox also did demonstrations with there. And this is all fully standard version one uh, NVMe over fabric, so multi-vendor. There's also a lot of startups in there. They tend to move faster. So, um, but you can see there's there's um, you know the, all the SSD players are there as well. So uh, the NVMe.org did something very unique when they came out with the first version of the standard, and that was that they had. Uh, open source software for Linux available at the same time that allowed you to download open source software for both the initiator and the target. And there was also a management, um, a small management piece of software that allowed you to configure it. And that software you can, you can get today. Um, if you go to that same website I showed earlier, the, I think it's called melodoxcommunity.com, you can find instructions or you can just go to GitHub and, or do a Google search and you can find out how to download this software. And if you've got a couple of servers and a couple of RNICs, you can test this yourself. One thing to keep in mind, uh, these are the results from that open source software right as it came out. Um, Elker showed even better results. A lot depends on how you configure your system from an SSD perspective, from wire, you know, from the speed of your network, and from the CPUs your initiator um, capabilities, the PCI buses and how they're configured so you have SSDs and, and the HBA or the Arnix um, uh, on the right PCI buses without um, too much QPI or um, Intel to Intel process socket communications. You'll get a lot of different results, but these are still very impressive results for some open source code that came out at the same time as the standard. It um, has already been accepted upstream, so it'll be in a Red Hat release um, to be announced by Red Hat. And that uh, would be, you know, you'll have to talk to them about exactly when that's coming out. But like I said, it's already upstream. So we were seeing about 12 microsecond difference in latency local versus remote with this setup. Um, we tried to do a setup that would be typical of a customer. So it's got 25 gig downlinks to the, to the initiators or to the clients and 50 gig link to the um, target for SSDs. And um, you can see the difference in performance running FIO locally on the target versus remotely uh, across the network is about 12 microseconds. I've seen as low as eight if you use 100 gig links um, and very fast um, SSDs. Um, so, you know, your mileage may vary, but the point is it's, it's a latency difference that most software can't can't even notice. And what that does is it enables a lot of applications. Um, the first one, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, so you can load, it's a, it's a block interface. It's a standard block interface. So you can load a file system on it straight. Yeah, so all of the testing that, so there were, we showed lots of test data, so I can see where it would overwhelm you. Sorry about that. So Elker's first test data showed what SSDs alone will do. And then he showed the difference in connecting SSDs across the network over NVMe over fabrics or locally, which is the same thing I'm showing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in this demonstration, so, so this is a SAN. What, that right there is a SAN. Okay, there's a switch 
with adapters uh, connecting the clients to a storage system. Yeah. It has different names, you know, like anything, we call the same thing many different names to confuse us. Yeah, so storage area network can run on fiber channel or Ethernet with iSCSI or, you know, yeah. Basically, the definition is you've got storage here and people accessing it here, and there's a network in the middle. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, so what that low latency um, difference allows us to do is to really expand the applications of storage to much higher performance. So for example, um, here's another one that has many names. So scale out storage is sometimes called software defined storage. Basically what it is is a bunch of commodity servers running a software that clusters the, the, the storage on them into a pool. And this can be NAS, object, or block, or all of the above. And if you look at the inside of one of those big refrigerators you can buy from EMC for multi-million dollars or Hitachi or you know, HP 3PAR, what you find is a very high performance, very low latency network inside. And that's why those boxes have so much performance. With MVMe over fabrics, you can do that with a commodity network. Granted, the software has to be good, but you can do it. You have the infrastructure to do it. Another question? Um, in particular, when you say commodity network, are you describing like the requirements versus Ethernet, or is it the span of band over Ethernet, or something else? So it depends on the performance level you want to get. But um, so, and today, what's available today, the open source software runs with RDMA, um, which is can be an InfiniBand, it can be on Ethernet. And there's, multi, there's two different versions on Ethernet, one called iWarp and one called Rocky. The testing that we've done is all been done with Ethernet Rocky. There was some, some demonstrations at the supercomputer conference on InfiniBand because it'll run on InfiniBand 2 and a lot of the government guys, you know, that are probably listening to us anyway now are, <laughs> <laughs> they, they use a lot of InfiniBand and they're doing it on InfiniBand. But, um, it, it, um, there's a new standard kind of in the works now to run it across just regular TCP IP. But, but what you're going to see there, and we'll go into it in more detail in a minute, is you're going to lose that latency factor. It doesn't have to be, and I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Understand. Save uh, save it for two. I think two, maybe three slides. <laughs> so erasure coding is totally independent of NVMe over fabrics. But you know, you know, I don't want to give a pitch for my company <laughs> too much. But we, that can also be offloaded like NVMe over fabrics into into the adapters. And so. Um, Another application for NVMe over fabrics that's enabled by this latency, and this is an application that's out there now, but with much higher latency, is hyperconverged. That's where you take that software-defined network or that scale-out storage, um, pooled storage cluster, and you add the applications right on top of it. So the storage, the distributed storage network, as well as the applications are running on the same machines. And where the real advantage besides performance comes in here is that you're able to free up, and I didn't show it in a lot of detail, but uh, you could have seen, a few, few slides back you would have seen the utilization of NVMe over fabrics because the RDMA protocol offloads the CPU from running the, the stacks, uh, the, the transport stack, the TCP IP. You get a lot of extra CPU back. So that test uh, that I showed a couple slides ago, it basically used two cores to run, you know, that latency at over a million IOPS with that um, bandwidth. So, for hyperconverged, you get a lot of free cycles now to run applications. Also, you get super low performance. So think of a hyperconverged um, application that's accessing data on a different node at basically the same performance it would locally and what that does to the capabilities of a hyperconverged application. 
Another um, application that's basically enabled by NVMe over fabrics is called compute storage disaggregation. And what this is doing is taking the compute and the storage apart. So it used to reside in the same machine or across a network with a lot of added latency. Now what you can do, for example, if you have an application that runs, say it's a, a website in the day and you're serving up pages, and at night you want to run Hadoop and analyze who was on your pages, you can reconfigure the, the compute and the storage to match those two very different storage requ compute requirement applications. And this is what a lot of the hyperscalers are doing with NVMe over fabric. And then finally, the classic sand. You know, the classic sand where you've got storage and compute and what you're doing is getting all the classic sand um, capabilities that I talked about before. Question? Yeah, so the, the RAIDs, you mean the RAID that would be uh, up here on, the, uh, on these controllers? Yeah, so um, there's different ways to solve that, and, and it's going to get a little bit deep, but um, you can, so when the NVMe data comes into a classic SAND storage array, it goes into the memory that the CPU can then do whatever RAID it wants on it, but you can also do it with offloads in the hardware. So for example, our NICs have capabilities to do erasure coding that I was talking about a little bit before, and also RAID calculations on the data as it goes by. So you can do it, you can approach it two different ways. And a lot of the storage arrays will do that in custom ASICs or FPGAs as well. Hey, you want to comment? Sure. Uh, yeah, in the SSDs, uh, in the traditional uh, HDD-based uh, solutions, storage arrays, RAID makes sense because of the performance reasons, whether you do it for performance or you for reliability, right? Uh, high availability. When it, when it comes to SSDs, because the performance is such a high, we're looking at the reliability factor, we're looking at the, uh, the different form, uh, implementations like dual port drives, like a SAS dual port drives, that gives you the uh, high availability. But in terms of the performance wise, the, like Rob said, is the software rate. Uh, that solves uh, some of your issues when you're uh, on the host uh, in a solution like uh, you have CPUs inside the box. Also, another thing to keep in mind is a lot of these kind of solutions, what they'll do is they'll just make copies. So like Ceph, for example, is an object solution that does it this way, but a lot of the um, store, you know, hyper-converged or the uh, software-defined storage will do it. They'll just make copies, and that works pretty well with NVMe or Fabric 2 because you can make copies a lot faster. Uh, okay, so let's see. So why is NVMe so fast? Um, so basically what it does is it takes that very efficient interface that Elker described locally and it projects it across the network. And um, that command structure, actually the whole command structure, think of it like a PCI bus extension almost. And it does this at very high performance by using this RDMA interface that we talked about earlier. Um, bypasses the TCP IP stack and basically the function of the TCP IP stack is now in the RNIC. And I'll go into details on that for, for you in a minute. Uh, anyway, if you want more details on all the bits and bytes, you can go to that community page and it points you to the specs and all kinds of good stuff. Another question? Um, so Elker had a slide earlier on that showed RDMA iSCSI versus um, NVMe, and basically it's a, about a doubling of performance. That's using the TCP, the ISCA, or the TCP, that isn't using the TCP IP stack, so that's bypassing that. He had an example showing iSCSI 2 that was then four times more, or four times less performance than, than uh, uh, NVMe uh, over fabric. Oh, InfiniMan um, uh, with NVMe? Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. Uh, with NVMe over fabric, the difference, if it, 
first of all, you have to match the speed. So you, if you match 100 gig Ethernet to the latest and greatest InfiniBand, which is also 100 gig, you see maybe a microsecond difference. And that's mainly in the switch. If you go point to point, you probably won't see that as much. But what the switch has is a cam to go to the layer three. So it's doing a lookup to match the local address to the IP address. And that adds a, basically a microsecond of latency. OK, so going into RDMA a little bit more uh, and MDMA over fabric. So the two technologies are, are a real good fit. In fact, it appears to me I mean, most of these standards, they steal from standards before them what they like, and they change what they don't. And uh, I think that the MVME standard basically took a lot from the RDMA standard, because they basically have the same queuing structure. And so what MVME over Fabrics does is it utilizes that. So what happens is a command comes out of the NVME uh, interface, or, soft, or operating system interface, and it gets encapsulated into an RDMA command. So it goes into the queue for NVMe, it gets encapsulated into the queue for RDMA, it crosses the network, it ends up in the RDMA inbound queue, it gets de-encapsulated and put in the remote NVMe device queue. As far as the NVMe device at this end and the operating system at this end know, they, they don't know anything different. There was no protocol translations, it was just an encapsulation. And then, because you're basically passing pointers to move data usually, there's some management, but in usual case you're moving data, what happens is RDMA is then used to move the data. And what RDMA is, is the remote version of DMA. DMA, direct memory access, is basically an engine in the CPU that allows you to move data from one memory location to another without having to do load and store in a software loop. So you basically give this engine two pointers, a counter, Boom, it moves the data. And in this case, you give two different RNICs, pointers, and a counter, and boom, it moves the data without any interaction with the CPU. So that's where the cycles are saved on the CPU side. What um, is different, and we're going to address your problem now, is that instead of having the TCP IP layer handling the transport, which means making sure the messages got across the network. If there was congestion, they figure out how to back off and avoid it. If data is lost, they figure out how to retransmit it. All those transport features, instead of that happening in the operating system, it now happens on the hardware of that RNIC. And that's also how you save a lot of CPU cycles. So originally, RDMA was developed for an InfiniBand network. And an InfiniBand network is a lossless network. It's a very designed for very high performance for supercomputers. And so it doesn't lose data very well. And when RDMA first moved to Ethernet, there were two different versions. One of them called iWarp, which still used TCP IP, but it, tr it did a TCP offload engine on, on the hardware. And one version that used the InfiniBand transport built into the hardware, and that was called Rocky. And the TCP IP function actually adds that latency back in. So most um, implementations are done with Rocky today. And I mean, like these are huge, huge data centers. For example, we can talk about a couple of them. Microsoft Azure, for example, all run on our DMA Rocky. And they initially, because it was designed for this lossless network, I'm getting back to that, sorry for the long story. Um, it was not, it tried to take advantage of the new changes to ethernet that came about by FCOE. And that required a thing called priority flow control, which basically implements the same flow control that's in InfiniBand in the network. And so if too much data is coming into the network, it gives a pause frame, and the pause frame stops it, and that's how fiber channel was originally done over Ethernet. That causes problems, because if you start stopping data here, it can cause backups you know, throughout the system. What Rocky did originally was use that, and so it kind of got a little bit of a bad name. But in follow-on, and there's white papers from Microsoft that'll explain this process. So this is huge data centers, right? So it, you have to work through these problems. This hardware-based transport was improved to the point where now you can run it 
openly on any network without any form of flow control. Now, to get better performance, because remember, you're trying to get that very high performance. You really need to implement flow control to get the high performance, but it'll work at a lower performance level without that flow control. And the reason you want that flow control, and there's different versions and different ways you can set it up. There's a thing called ECN, which is less intrusive than the, than the pause, the priority flow control we talked about. All of those allow the performance characteristics that we talked about to be, you know, seen. Whereas if you just run it open and you cause some collisions, and again, you can also over provision your network, but if you um, just run it open on a network and it ends up with some, some amount of congestion, you're just going to see a drop in the performance. And that's proven across data centers the size of Azure that you have probably seen pictures of. It's big. Does that answer your question? You're welcome. You're welcome. So um, I think my last slide here, and then we'll take more questions, is uh, uh, about um, the products that are available today. And this is not a full list, so if you're in the audience and you have a product, um, send me an email and I'll put it on the slide for the next show. Um, so here's a bunch of companies that'll deliver you NVMe over Fabric products today. And then reference designs, pretty much all the SSD vendors have reference designs. Uh, Elker's company has one that you can, you know, if you buy a lot of SSDs, they'll probably, and you're nice to Elker, he'll give you one and you can <laughs> test it out. Or um, you can buy a system from one of these guys that does NVMe over fabrics today. He said that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so in conclusion, um, you know, there's this new technology um, that uh, is needed for very fast um, SSDs. And it's called NVMe over fabrics. And the message takeaway here is if you're using NVMe and you want to put it across a fabric, you know, it's faster storage, so you need a faster network. And um, RDMA technology is how it, what makes it fast. And, you know, um, this performance is going to enable a lot of applications that, you know, we don't even know about today because it's basically the same as local. And it's only going to get better with persistent memory. And you can get products today. And that's uh, our talk. We'll take questions. Thanks. Thank you. Here's your chart on the classic SAN supply that uh, NVMe ESSDs that are something that you can do dual ported SATs. It looks like you have PCI Express switch. Yeah, yeah. So dual ported, uh, dual ported NVMe drives are available today from some vendors and will be available pretty much across the industry by middle of next year, I'd say. Yeah, I'm not in a position to announce our product roadmaps. I will leave it to our management, but yes, dual port drives are available, certainly for SAS drives, SAS SSDs, but you would expect the MME dual port drives to come in near future. Other vendors already have. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oops. Uh, yeah, what would that be? I think, boy, I think what that's showing is that you can, you can do really interesting things with NVMe SSDs in that you could set up the copy to occur between, you know, the, the high availability sides to happen in the background. And that, that's probably not available today either, but think about the fact that you now have a PCI fabric and you have SSD controllers and you can program them to do special things. You know, different vendors will have different ways to do that. Yeah, if you're familiar with the SAS dual ports, how they work, I mean, it's essentially they're taking the same premise on the architecture wise. So when you're doing writes to the uh, drives or blocks that uh, splits into two drives or many drives. So it depends on number of drives, how you set up the uh, setup. So you can have high availability. It mainly addresses the high availability, not so much the uh, not so much for the performance. Yeah, similar things like reservation capabilities and things like that all in there. Yeah, it, there's actually a spec called um, NVMe-MI, I believe, mm -hmm. that matches all the SCSI commands to mm -hmm. NVMe commands. Mm -hmm. And the NVMe over Fabrics just passes those commands right to the SSDs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm 
Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, some of those companies I showed on this last slide here um, that I can jump to. So some of these, especially the startups here, and actually some of the SSD vendors are providing that software uh, to go with their system. So for example, I hate to plug people, but uh, you know, Pavilion, Accelero, Mangstore, all these startups that already have systems you can buy, they're doing all the things that you would expect from an all flash array from EMC mm -hmm. or something, somebody like that, over NVMe, over Fabric. Yeah, software-defined storage companies, they provide, whether it's a duplication, snapshots, all those services, but we are focused on the hardware piece. And the Red Hat, uh, Ceph, uh, I mean, Ceph uh, obviously duplicates multiple uh, copies. That's one of the factors. Yeah. One other thing on that real quick, there's also an effort underway in the SNE organization, if you're familiar with that, to actually take a look at file systems and redesign them in ways to also take advantage of this super fast storage. So a lot of times, Ceph is a good example, there's a lot of processing that occurs and you can't always take advantage of faster storage, even though SSDs with Ceph do make a difference, but you can't take all the advantage. And so that organization um, is working on how you speed up the upper level software to take advantage of these. Not, and they're actually aim, aiming even further. They're really aiming at the persistent memory, which is again 100 times faster. Sorry, go ahead. From which perspective? Um, that's a good question. So initially for sure, but there's two different things to think about there. One is that it's, it's gonna be accessible from the memory bus instead of the IO bus, the PCI bus. So that's one potential difference. And secondly, it's again so much faster. So if you remember my slide where I showed the red, I showed it even smaller for persistent memory. And so what my company is working on with the industry now is how do we make some tweaks to our DMA in order to be ready for even lower latencies and the higher performance wires, those are coming. You know, that's sort of a marching along faster, faster, faster. But um, we have to get that protocol faster. And I've given talks on that before at other conferences. If you want to come up after, I can tell you what's yeah. going on there in, in more yeah. detail. Just to add to Rob's comment, is the, uh, is the, uh, the MME org is working on the, uh, and Senior, on the PMIO, uh, extensions for RDMA, I mean, it's for the MMO fabric. So that's process, I mean, that's work is still going on. Uh, that's not closed yet. Yeah, good point. We have to. We only have 10 minutes to load in the next slide. Okay. okay, all right. Sorry, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah.